When you think about the best-selling Nintendo games of all time, you could probably guess most of them. Wii Sports, Pokemon, Super Mario Bros. on the NES, Mario Kart 8 and Animal Crossing on the Switch, these are certainly the low-hanging fruit. But one game that you may not consider that's right up there in the top 10 best-selling Nintendo games at number 7 is Tetris. Tetris is a puzzle game that was originally created in 1984 by Alexei Pajitnov. The game is simple, to complete lines by moving 7 different shaped blocks that fall down a narrow playfield. As lines are completed, the player earns more points. The gameplay usually contains levels, and after a certain number of lines are completed, the player will then move to the next level, where the gameplay is sped up and forces the player to react quicker, as pieces fall at random. Each of the seven shaped blocks or tetrominoes have their own names. I, O, T, J, L, S, and Z. These shapes will be immediately familiar to anyone who's played the game before. In Tetris, the player will be warned about what piece will be dropping next as they are currently navigating the current piece on the playfield. While Tetris has a reputation for being a relaxing puzzle game, Tetris requires skill and at the top level it's one of the most competitive and complex games to truly master. The Game Boy version of Tetris was released in 1989 and it was a smash hit selling over 35 million copies alone. The core gameplay is identical but in many ways, Tetris on the Game Boy is the definitive way to play. Not only is the Game Boy a portable handheld, its tile-based rendering is a perfect fit for the game. On the Game Boy, the playfield represents a 10 by 18 block of tiles, which are 8 by 8 pixels. This means the playfield is 80 pixels across by 144 pixels in height, which is the exact height of the Game Boy's entire resolution. Each tetromino that falls are Game Boy sprites, that are made of the same tile, but represented in the formation of that piece. When the sprite has hit its line, it's converted to a background tile. This is done because there is a limit of 40 sprites on screen per frame and 10 sprites per scan line. This means at the most, the game will only ever render 8 sprites, leaving plenty of overhead for the game logic, music and sound effects. The entire cartridge was 32 kilobytes in size and fit neatly in the Game Boy's ROM address space and required no bank switching to retrieve more data from. Tetris on the Game Boy is simple, clean and addictive. But behind the scenes, a major technical hurdle would need to be overcome, and that is random number generation or RNG. This concept is crucial to Tetris on the Game Boy, as it determines the next puzzle piece that will drop. So what exactly is the problem? Let's say that we want to build our own RNG function to generate random numbers. How would we go about doing it? Well, here is a simple example that I wrote in C, and I might add it's not a very good one. But let's take a closer look. You can see that I'm generating a random number by taking a input value known as a seed and adding that to the number 900, and then subtracting 52 from that result, and then returning that as the random number. Now, if we call this function three times and pass in a seed value of 100, you'll note that we get the same result every single time. But what if that seed value is different? You'll see that we get three different values. By passing in a seed value that comes from a ever-changing source, like for example a computer system clock, we can generate randomness. Now, in this example, it's not a very good way to build RNG as I mentioned. But it is important to note that this is not true randomness. Instead, this is known as deterministic or pseudo-random. This is because the seed will always determine the result. If the seed value is the same, then the result will always be the same. But by ensuring the seed value is ever-changing, again, like that of a system clock, then we can expect random numbers to be output. So what then is the problem on the Game Boy? Well, the answer to that is, it has no system clock at all. And while this may seem like a critical flaw or omission in the hardware, we must consider the Game Boy and its games. Many games were 2D side-scrolling affairs with enemies, tiles and sprite placements in the exact same parts of the game every single time. For example, if you play Mario Land 5 times in a row and press the buttons and move the same places every time, the result will always be the same. So for the most part, the Game Boy didn't need a clock for its games. But when it came to Tetris, it was a major problem for the developer. 
Without a good randomization seed, Tetris on the Game Boy would just spit out the same piece every single time, and that wouldn't make the game much fun to play at all. But of course we know that the game does push out random pieces, so let's understand how this randomization problem was solved. We said that the Game Boy has no clock, but it does have an internal timer. And we know that the CPU clock speed on the Game Boy runs at 4.19 MHz. There are two internal states to measure the time taken to execute a single CPU instruction. And the one that's used in the randomization of Tetris pieces on the Game Boy is known as the divider register. This register increments at a rate of 16384 Hz. So what this means is when the CPU is executing instructions after 16384 Hz has been hit, the div register will take its current value and increment it by one. On the Game Boy, the div register is only one byte or eight bits wide. So it can only go up to 255 before setting back to zero. But if we take a close look at this register in any game that we play on a Game Boy emulator, for example, you can see that when we pause the game, we start to see seemingly random seed values generated from this register. The problem, however, is once again, it's deterministic. In theory, if you side by side two games of Tetris starting at the exact same time after power on and the div register contains the same values, then both systems would have the same piece fallout. Or another way of testing this is if we set the value of zero in the div register and hard code it, you'll note that the same piece falls out every single time. So given all this, what did Nintendo do to add randomness to Tetris? Well, fortunately, with modern reverse engineering techniques, we can clearly follow along with the algorithm. The random number generation code takes the random seed from div, iterates down by seven, which is the total number of pieces, until it hits zero. Each Tetris piece is numbered from zero to six, and the code will use a bitwise exclusive all operation. The result of this code will be the next piece. However, to generate more randomness, the same code is run two more times. And if on the last try, the piece is the same as the previous block piece, then fetch a new value from div and try one more time. While simple enough, the frequencies in which getting two pieces in a row are significantly reduced, but it is still possible. The div register acting as the seed is still not granular enough to stop this from occurring. And because it resets back to zero once it's hit 255, even with a re-roll, the new piece can still be the same as the last piece. Hank Rogers, who was an owner in the Tetris company, acknowledged that the randomizer in the game wasn't working very well until the last minute when Nintendo would step in to help implement it in the game. When Nintendo first mastered up uh, Game Boy Tetris, they sent it to me on Friday, and so we all test played it, and I said, the pieces are not random, and I told my guys to, to count the pieces, and you know, are, you know, what's the deal? And one of the pieces, I don't know, S or Z, was coming yeah. up twice as much as the rest of the oh, pieces. Really? It was really that obvious. And I said, this is not acceptable. We can't, we can't publish the game if the pieces are not random. Mm -hmm. And when you go through the same sequence and go through the same, same, the same thing happens to you over wow. and over and over again. Oh, no. And so uh, the, I, I said, it's not going to pass. And they sent guys out to my office in Yokohama from Kyoto. It's the first time I got a Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> they sent those guys, the programmer and the producer, they came over and we, we spent Saturday working out a random number generator. I should mention that the use of the div register is one approach to randomization on the Game Boy and other games, for example, Pokemon, would also develop their own RNG functions. Another approach to randomness and one that's used by GB Studio a modern day homebrew development environment is to use player input as the seed. The thought process here is that it's extremely unlikely that two players will ever have the exact same input state on the same frame, given that the hardware refreshes at nearly 60 frames per second. In the end, the original Game Boy was a perfect fit for Tetris, an addictive and simple puzzle game that all ages could enjoy. The randomizer represents one of the most fascinating parts of the code which worked well enough given the extreme limitations of the Game Boy hardware. And with that, this is the end of today's episode. And I do hope you enjoyed this closer deep dive look at Tetris on the Game Boy. It's a fascinating subject to cover and it was one that I really enjoyed. But if you guys liked this episode, please don't forget to leave me a thumbs up, like and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.